we're about ready to get started. That was some great uh, power music. Uh, thanks to Kristen Rusbolt. Um, good evening and welcome to UNCG's panel discussion, acknowledging the accomplishments of female athletes, recognizing the influence of sports participation for women and girls, and honoring the progress and continuing struggle for equality for women in sports. Uh, tonight, we are recognizing the annual day of observance uh, for National Girl and Women in Sports Day, which is actually tomorrow, February the 3rd. We have five powerful women who are trailblazers in sport, and we will hear their stories and how those stories shape them and have created opportunities for women today. We hope that you will be inspired tonight and continue on your journey to advocate and advance women in sport. My name is Kim Record. I'm the Director of Athletics at UNC Greensboro in Greensboro, North Carolina. I am in my 12th season with the Spartans and I became the first female AD at UNCG and in the Southern Conference in 2009. I have the pleasure and honor to serve as moderator for tonight's conversation, uh, which to share with you, we have people from the Philippines, Costa Rica, uh, Southern Conference colleagues across the United States, and a special shout out to UNCG and North Carolina Central student athletes. Um, we are so glad to have you with us this evening. A couple of Zoom etiquette items. Uh, use the chat feature to ask questions, share comments and feedback. Please mute your microphones and turn off your video so we can focus on our outstanding panelists. My introductions are going to be brief. Um, you can Google each one of them if you want to get the full list of their accomplishments and accolades, we wanna spend uh, the next hour uh, listening to our panelists share their journeys and ways in which they each have broken barriers to put us all in a position to celebrate the 35th annual National Girls and Women in Sport Day. So we're gonna get started. Please welcome Lenora Gion Furman. Lenora is a nine-time French national champion in track. She graduated from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, where she was a two-time All-American in the 400. Lenora is currently training for the 2021 French Olympic team. Lenora, we will have our fingers crossed for you as you look to fulfill your dream this summer. The next panelist is a colleague and has become a friend, uh, Dr. Ingrid Wicker McCree. Ingrid began her career in intercollegiate athletics as a student athlete, playing volleyball for George Washington University while getting a degree in criminal justice. She coached volleyball and softball before moving into administration. She has been the director of athletics at North Carolina Central University since 2008 and in 2014 was recognized by the Women Leaders in College Sports Organization as its NCAA FCS Administrator of the Year. She received her master's and doctorate degree at North Carolina State University, and she currently serves on the NCAA Division I Council. Next up, we have Ashley Huffman, Dr. Ashley Huffman. Dr. Huffman serves as the International Affairs Specialist, Sports Diplomacy, and she currently lives in Washington, DC. She is a published author, professor, entrepreneur, and documentary film producer. She uses sport as a tool for social change. Huffman earned her undergraduate degree from Eastern Kentucky University, where she captained the women's basketball team. She received her master's and doctorate degree from the University of Tennessee. In 2018, her co-led efforts on a global sports mentoring program 
resulted in the ESPN Stuart Scott Humanitarian Award and the Peace and Sport Diplomatic Action of the Year. I'm also very excited to have Jennifer King with us tonight. She recently spoke at uh, my local Rotary Club and she is the assistant running backs coach for the Washington football team. In this role, King became the first full-time black female coach in NFL history. King has also had coaching roles with the Carolina Panthers and Dartmouth College after playing professionally in the Women's Football Alliance. She earned a degree at Guilford College while competing in both basketball and softball. She was the head coach of the Johnson and Wales Charlotte women's basketball team and an assistant women's basketball coach at Greensboro College. King holds a master's degree from Liberty University. Our final panelist is Debbie Yao. I want to publicly acknowledge Debbie because she probably isn't aware um, how much she has impacted my life professionally and personally. I was terrified of her when she first became the athletic director at Maryland, but grew to appreciate the way in which she ran a program. She's a true trailblazer. She began her career as a student athlete playing, playing basketball at Elon University. I think it was Elon College, but Elon University. And recently retired as the director of athletics at North Carolina State University. In between, she coached at Kentucky, Oral Roberts in Florida. Her transition to administration um, actually began, began here in Greensboro as a fundraiser for UNC Greensboro. So we consider her a Spartan. Yao has been the director of athletics at St. Louis University and the University of Maryland, where she became the first female AD in ACC history. Both Street and Smith's Sport Business Journal and the Chronicle of Higher Education have cited Yao as being one of the 20 most influential people in college athletics. And she still serves college athletics today. I haven't seen her in forever. And we sat on a Zoom call earlier today for our National Association, NACDA. So, wow, I'm a little bit overwhelmed here with this terrific panel, uh, but we do wanna get started. Um, can each of you spend some time talking about how you arrived in your current position and identify one individual who supported or motivated you along the way? Debbie, we're going to begin with you, although your current position is retired. Um, talk about how you got to that point and who helped you along the way. Well, Kim, I, I think of. Uh... 44 years is long enough, and uh, I'm the oldest person on the call tonight, whether I like it or not. Uh, my mom was influential. She was a basketball player in high school at a point in time in the 30s when that just wasn't happening. But in the county school systems of North Carolina, it was not only allowed, it was encouraged, odd as that sounds today. And so uh, we all, uh, my brother also, of course, uh, competed. He was a football player at Clemson. But uh, I would say my mom, uh, because, you know, it's so natural to see her and to follow in her footsteps. Okay, Lenora. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so um, it's actually my first coach that uh, motivated me because I'm from a little island. Nobody knows about us. Although we are French, but a lot of people don't know about us. So we were just training. I was 10 and I was just running and he came from France and he just saw a group of girls that had potential and he talked to us about national team. So even though at first we didn't believe him, we start training and uh, I was 14 when I won my first national team. I mean, national French team and uh, Every, every since we keep winning and that's him that put the seed in our head that we could actually win something even though we are from a small island and ever since I've been in the national team for nine years and that's when everything started for us and for me. 
That's, uh, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, Ashley, what about you? Uh, well, first, thanks so much, Kim. I feel like I'm on a panel with legends. And so I was very excited to be here. And um, I would say, you know, I've had great people all along the way, teachers and coaches. That's why I wanted to be a teacher and a coach, because I've had people at every step, at every juncture, in that critical moment, inspire me to, to keep going and take the next right step. And of course, my parents. But I would say specifically, when I was uh, in graduate school at the University of Tennessee, I come from a very small town in West Virginia. And to be honest, I didn't even really know what graduate school was. And I was sitting there and uh, I was asked to write a paper about my experiences and, and being there. And, um, you know, I wrote something and my professor, Dr. Joy DeCincy, who was also a trailblazer and pioneer, she wrote on the top of my paper in red ink, actually, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And it was an Eleanor Roosevelt quote. And from that moment forward, it was like, it doesn't matter that you're from an 800 person town in Poco, West Virginia, you can do anything you put your mind to. And so I had a lot of female role models in my life, but Dr. DeCincy is one of them. Okay, thank you. A lot of us have teachers as, as mentors. Jennifer, you've had a lot going on here recently. Yeah, uh, it's been busy recently, but um... You know, there's been so many people who have helped me along the way. I think, um, you know, at this moment in, in my life, I have to thank Coach Ron Rivera. Obviously, he's my boss now um, in Washington, but he was someone when I decided to, to make the crazy move from, you know, being a successful college basketball coach to just go jump into football. Uh, he was always there to support me. And, um, you know, I give him credit along with other coaches in the league, but he's willing to open up the, the coaching pool and to everybody and not just limited to, to what it had always been. So I'm always thankful for him to um, opening his mind and everyone else's mind to, that women can coach in the National Football League. So he's someone that I'm definitely thankful for. Okay, Ingrid. You're on mute. Famous last words for 2020. <laughs> Okay, they're trying to silence the other part. So I obviously I've done something. Critical alert from Microsoft. <laughs> so your computer can you hear me over that though? Yeah, not really. You can. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's I'm nice to stop background it. kind of voice. Okay, so I will say first of all, thank you for this opportunity, and I'm going to fix this in a minute. But thank you for this opportunity for this to be a part of this celebration. Um, I have to also give shout outs to all of my women student athletes. We're represented by every team here tonight and departments on campus, as well as one of our booster club uh, board members is here. So this is exactly why I do what I do and why I come to work today because of them. Um, I would say I've had several different significant people in my life, like all of us. Um, and I could trace back to in high school who that was, my coach, Ann Harris, and she was just a winner. She won six state championships in volleyball. And so I learned very on, early on what hard work meant in terms of trying to be a winner. I think when I went to college, Pat Sullivan was my coach, but she's always been in my life ever since. And then my real introduction to athletic administration um, and piqued my interest was at North Carolina State, Judy Martino and uh, Pat Hilscher. Both were very significant in my career, um, choosing administration, choosing coaching. And so all of them, as you notice, were women. I did have some significant mentors as males, men in my life, but most of them, and I'm so proud of that, have been men. So I'm gonna fix my computer though. Uh, well, that's great. And Ingrid, I don't know if you knew that Pat Hilscher's on the call. I saw her name and uh, she's a Spartan as well. So uh, it's exciting to see all of these. Uh, right now, I think we have 212 people joining us, uh, which is, is terrific. Um, we're gonna uh, have some questions that were pre-submitted uh, by the audience and so, not necessarily do you all have to answer, uh, but some may resonate with you more than others. Uh, I think you all could answer, what, what advice do you have for young women, girls interested in pursuing a career 
in sport. Uh, Ashley, would you like to take that first? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I would say the best piece of advice I could give you is to know your why, uh, to know why it is you do the things that you do. What is your purpose? What are your core values? And how do you stay consistent with those things as you continue to lead and interact with others? I think, you know, so often we think if adversity comes and I'm here to tell you it's not if, but when and for how long. <laughs> So if you know your why and you know, and you can be grounded in that, then I think you can overcome and continue to stay the course even when it's difficult. So I would say that's, that's the biggest thing that's helped me is to know, know my why. I like that, that's great advice. Uh, Debbie, what advice would you have? Oh my goodness, the, the single most important thing I can think of Kim is be careful who you listen to um, and whose advice you take. Your life is gonna end up looking like that advice. So obviously if you choose poorly and uh, you choose the wrong people, uh, you trust the wrong people, you're gonna make a number of really poor decisions and you're never gonna fulfill your uh, potential. That is great advice. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, they, they said some great things. I, I think to, to add to that is, you know, how do you handle your failures? Um, so because they're gonna be tough times and, you know, do you use those to propel yourself forward and onward, or do you dwell and feel sorry for yourself? So it's very important to be able to handle yourself, um, your successes, along with your failures, um, just in order to get where you want to be. Okay, that is great advice. Uh, Ingrid, are you fixed there with your technology? I am fixed. <laughs> um, I would say, think, you know, always think about what people are going to say about you, right? When, when we're hiring coaches and staff members, you know, I always ask the question, well, what would, what would the custodial staff say about you? What would the academic advisor say about you? What do the students say about you? And so that's your character. And so always think about before you make decisions, um, what you're going to say, what, how does it impact the other person? Because in this industry, you're serving, we're servant leaders, we're serving others. And so it's very important that people know that you are authentic, that you are you have empathy. And so always remember what, what is it that, what kind of impression are you gonna leave with the student athletes, your staff and your constituents? I like that, um, that is true. Uh, you can't be above doing whatever you ask someone else to do. Um, Dion, uh, what about you? What advice do you have? Obviously your path has been a little bit different but I'm sure you've worked very hard to get where you are. Um, I would say to go for it because when you don't, then you have regrets and I hate to live with regrets. So just go for it, but be prepared, be mentally prepared and um, check your surrounding. Just like uh, they said, you have to check your surrounding because they have an important impact in what you do. So don't listen to everybody, but choose your, your surrounding and go for it. I, I'm a go-getter. I don't like to, yeah, I need to go get it. If you know what you want to do, if you know that's what you want, then go get it. Because if you don't, then you're going to regret it. No regrets, no regrets. Uh, this is a question um, from a student athlete um, that uh, wants to know uh, how can we help inspire young girls to join sport, sports from our positions as student athletes? Um, Ingrid, let's start with you. Um, I, you know, all of you, and especially the student athletes that are here on the call, do so much community service work. And I think that is the, the, the most you give yourself more, more access and you give young boys and girls more access to you when you're out in the community and you're volunteering. And so to continue, continue doing that, but also make sure you're telling your story. All of us have a story. I don't care if you're 15 years old versus 53 years old, everyone has a story. And the more you do that, and especially sharing it with young women and young men or young women, um, now they understand, they have a better understanding of what you went through or what are the, the joys of being a student athlete, you know, uh, and the failures, but they need to understand and know 
the benefits of being a student athlete and, play, and to play. And so tell your story as often as you can and create opportunities where you're in front of young girls so that you can share your stories. Okay, and each of you were student athletes um, and so have had those experiences. Uh, Jennifer, um, how can student athletes help inspire young girls to join sports? I think it's so important for you guys to, to use your platform that you have because um, no matter where you play to a little a little girl, you're a rock star. And I think it's important to know that, you know, and get involved in the community um, as Ingrid touched on any way that you can. If you can help coach a team in your off season or to get involved in any way and, and there's not a program that you feel um, is adequate, look to create it or, or find a way to, to get um, women and girls involved in sport because I think it's huge for them to get involved in younger ages because it's proven that you know, self-esteem issues and so many different things are helped um, when females and girls get into sports. So really just find a way to get things done. If something's not already there, um, you can create it. Okay. Uh, Debbie, when you were the athletic director uh, uh, for the Wolfpack and a student athlete, a female student athlete came into your office um, and said they wanted to get involved in sport, uh, what, what would you say to them to help inspire them to get involved and get others involved? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, I'm sorry if I scared you when I was AD at uh, Maryland. Um, but you know, Kim, we all have our style and yep. natural style and we ought to just stick to it. And mine was, you know, getting, I just, I just wanna get to the essence of the conversation. So there's, I want to share this one quote with you. It's from Winston Churchill. And I have kept, I used to keep it in my middle desk drawer uh, because as, you know, when you're in a leadership role, uh, especially as a, as a minority, in our case, as a gender minority, and whether it's an ethnic minority or a gender minority, there are a lot of similarities. And you're making choices and decisions. You feel the pressure when, or I did, let me just say that, when, when uh, uh, people would come back uh, and, and disagree. And so this great quote from Winston Churchill, it goes like this. You have enemies, good. That means you stood for something sometime in your life. And that is so true. You cannot please everyone. And women as a group, so I'm gonna, I have no empirical statistical data to support this. I just know it's true experientially. We want, we please, we like to please people. We want everybody to be happy. You know, we want everybody to get along. Well, when you're in a leadership role in a very visceral environment, like intercollegiate athletics, it isn't always going to be that way. And so uh, my advice oftentimes would be not so much, it, um, although I love what Ingrid said, I, I want them to really think through whether or not they want to do this and what it might mean for them and how hard it could be and that it won't always be fun. Uh, and that if you're training for the Olympics, you're, you're going to have some bad days. And are they really up for that? Or if you're Jennifer and you're trying to, you've broken a glass ceiling and you, then not everyone's going to pat you on the back and say, oh boy, this is great. I've got, look, it's a woman coaching football. Um, so I just spent my time really trying to be real with them in, in that way. And I am sorry I scared you. Oh, I probably shouldn't have said that, but Debbie was one of the first ADs and she's right. Uh, we all have different styles and we take from different leaders. Uh, Debbie had a goal and nobody got in her way, uh, but she was able to say when she made a mistake that it was a mistake. So I'm not scared of you anymore. You've helped me. I, well, that makes me feel so much better, Kim. <laughs> that, yeah. that, we'll have to have a conversation about okay. that. It is interesting when you said, you know, women are pleasers and um, want everybody to get along. Um, this next question, what is the most challenging part of being in uh, a male dominated environment? Uh, and uh, Jim, how about you? Um, it's hard to say because in track and field, it's a individual sport. So men and women are together, but men get more attention, they get more sponsorship, they get more everything than a woman. So we just have to be there and to remind people that we are there, even when reporters are trying to talk to us and they only talk about our physical appearance rather than 
what we just did on the track. So you just have to put back the, the focus on what we did and that we are at it as well. But we don't have the same um, relation, you know, with men and women because we train together. Actually, I'm always the only woman in my team. I only train with guys. Every time I change coach, it just happened that I only train with guys. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to say about this. Okay. Jennifer, what about you? How challenging has that been? I think the biggest challenge is, is kind of from within just to prove yourself, um, to show why you're there. And I think that's something that you have to have a certain confidence about yourself to do. And obviously coaches are, are teachers and, you know, a successful coach in basketball. And I, I knew I could be successful coach in football as well. And, you know, once you build relationships uh, with the guys that you work with and the guys that you coach, um, I haven't had a lot of problems with that just because they know that I'm, I'm there to make them better um, and anything that I can do to help them, I'm willing to do. So um, I think that's the main thing is just have that confidence when you go in the room to have your, your head high and your chest out uh, just, and just have that belief that you belong there. Thank you. That's a great feedback. Ashley, uh, have you found uh, uh, work to be challenging and is it as male dominated in what you are doing? Well, let's just say I work in sport and government. So yes, I have a few men that I work with. Um, so I would say, you know, early on, my dad prepared me for this. When I was eight years old, I played on a co-ed basketball team and the guys never passed me the ball. It's the only girl out there. And I can remember throwing my jacket down in the parking lot, irritated, crying. And my dad said, Ashley, I hate to tell you this, but in life, it's just not equal. That it, like, as a girl, you can't just be as good as the boys, you're gonna have to be better. And so for me, that was always the quest is like, okay, I understand my expectation at eight was set is that I'm gonna always have to prove myself, you know, that it's always gonna be a little bit harder, that men are gonna be hired based on potential, women are gonna be hired based on achievement, what they've accomplished, but how do you accomplish something if you can't get hired, right? So it's, it's this vicious cycle of things. And, you know, I would just say to all the young women out there who are in male environments, raise your hand, do it, do it scared. Uh, let your knees shake and your voice quiver until you're not scared anymore. Take a chance on yourself and just do it anyway. Do it scared because I think that's the only way that you can ever really achieve anything is just to raise your own hand and put yourself, wheel your own seat to the table and make a way. I like that, do it scared. Ingrid, what about you? Uh, I, I think the most challenging part was at the beginning um, and earning the respect and trust. I remember going to have lunch with Debbie and uh, she told me to get the book, The Speed of Trust. And I did, mm -hmm. and Debbie has another version now too, um, a second edition. But I remember that being one of the most challenging things because I was, I was, I was a peer, you know, I was coaching. Um, I've been here for a very long time. And so a lot of these individuals, the men grew with me throughout my career. And so now shifting from being a peer to me being the team captain, I don't like using the word boss, but the team captain, uh, it was a challenge for them. I didn't have any problems with it, but it was a challenge with them in terms of um, being able to trust me in my new role. And also too, I would say, just making sure that you're ensuring that your voice is heard. You know, So how do you get to the table? I think there's a Shirley Chisholm quote and I can't, I'm trying to look it up, but it talks about bring your own chair, right? If you don't have a seat at the table, bring your own chair. And so I think it's very important that you make sure your voice is heard. Um, and with that, however, I've had to really work on my poker face. And I, I said, I was gonna write an article on your best poker face because you have to have one. And so, um, whereas very early in my career, I just, they knew what I was thinking, what I was feeling. And so I really had to work on my poker face so that I could really make sure that they heard me and uh, what I had to offer and contribute. Ingrid, thank you. I don't know if Stacy Koziak is on that, um, on this call, but uh, I had a, a staff member and a colleague and we talked about that poker face, how important it is. And she's moved on and is a deputy at Bowling Green State University where there's probably 14 inches of snow. Hope she's having fun there. 
Debbie, uh, you've worked with some of the most high profile uh, colleagues uh, in athletic directors, coaches. Um, what has been the most challenging part? Well, um, I think that when you're dealing with multimillionaires and you're their supervisor, so a very interesting dynamic. Um, Jennifer's in that dynamic uh, to a degree in the pro game and, and uh, so is Ingrid and you. Uh, you know, we all, have, we all have our stars that we're working with. Uh, I think Ingrid, Ingrid was talking about, you know, um, having people, it really comes down to a trust issue to be candid with you. And I'm going to go back to being authentic because I don't. I'm, I I think that you have to be able to deliver bad news in a in a good way, if that makes any sense. There just are times where you can't always agree, uh, but it is challenging to deliver the bad news, and it's also very much a part of leadership. And that's why a lot of people are really not suited for management uh, because they just hate delivering bad news. It's just it's not something they they are ready to manage themselves and take full responsibility. But to take responsibility for other people in other situations is something they just, they don't, they can't manage. Uh, they can't sleep well, they can't think right. And so it isn't for everyone, Kim. Um, and that's part of that management of that situation with high profile individuals is being authentic with them and quit trying to always figure out a way to keep everybody happy. Do the best you can under the circumstances um, and if you get back to who you surround yourselves with, if you have people who give you good advice, you're going to be way far, way far ahead of the game in that regard in terms of decision making uh, and know that there will be some rough times where you literally cannot deliver uh, the answer that someone wants. That is so very true. Uh, delivering uh, bad news. Um, I learned that bad news is bad news. Don't try and make it better. Short and sweet. Um, and uh, it took a while. Uh, as Ingrid said, you have to learn through, through adversity and making mistakes. Um, as women, we have lots of different roles. And, uh, you know, we are uh, daughters, mothers, uh, wives, uh, uh, you name it, athletic directors, professional uh, uh, sports. What do you think one of your roles has been and how does that play into how you define yourself as a woman in sport? Uh, because is there really any balance? And um, Ingrid, I'll start with you. Wow, let's see. Um, so I'm all of those. I'm, I'm a wife, a mother, you know, a friend, a daughter, um, an advocate, you know, I don't know how much of an athlete I am anymore because I only play golf. So this years of, you know, bad knees and shoulders. And so I only play golf, but I think that I know I'm an advocate and also a leader. And I think because I signed up for all this, you know, and so I'm committed and it is challenging to balance. Um, I remember probably early on when my daughter was younger, much younger, I had an itinerary and I would leave it for a team, a village. And whether it was some folks at work um, that were in my village, uh, my, my parents, I'm very blessed to live very close to family. And from seven o'clock in the morning, wake Sydney up. Who's gonna do that? At eight o'clock, take Sydney to daycare. Who's gonna do that? And I would send it out to my village and have people sign up on it, you know? And so, and it was very reflective of my role as here's where you all know I'm going to be as the athletic director, but also as a mom, this is what I have going on and I need help. So I think all of these different roles that you commit to, um, you have to make sure that you ask for help as well. Um, we do want to, to solve all the issues and be super woman, but we need help too. And so, and I think it's important that you figure out how to get that help. Uh, my women's basketball coach, her husband works in California. She has two young, young, young boys. Trish, you're going to have to get some help. Don't be ashamed of asking for that help because it's going to be challenging in your new role as a head coach, as a mom, as a wife across country, across, you know, across the country. And so 
Um, you just try to figure it out. But if you commit to those roles and you say I do to your significant other, then you got to commit to them just as much. Uh, that, that is a lot of roles. Um, and I've told staff to look in the mirror and practice saying, I need your help. We as women don't do that um, very well. Um, Jennifer, what about you? Um, how do the roles that you play, uh, titles that you might have uh, help define you as a woman in sport? Yeah, I think for me, you know, I've, I've been um, you know, on this journey to where I am you know, there hasn't been a lot of balance, you know, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, when, when I'm working, trying to get, um, you know, the results I wanted and to the level that, you know, I've been able to achieve, it hasn't been a lot of balance with outside things. Luckily, you know, I don't really have, um, you know, an immediate family like that. I didn't have my, you know, my parents and my, my sister, but um, it's tough. And, and on, this, on this road here, you know, I've missed a lot of events, you know, in sport. And that, that's something you're going to have to be willing to do. What are you willing to sacrifice to get where you want to be? And, um, you know, I sacrificed a lot. You know, I missed Christmas for the first time. I missed Thanksgiving for the first time this year. But it's something that, you know, that my family understands what I'm doing. And it's something that I'm willing to do to get where I want to be. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to always be that way forever. But, you know, on, on an upward climb, sometimes things have to, to be sacrificed. So I think it's so important to, to know that, you know, sometimes when you start this journey that um, you may have to make a choice sometimes. And, um, but now in the off season, obviously things kind of get um, more balanced out for me. But, you know, for six months of the year, um, I'm essentially unavailable. <laughs> you know, we're working 15 hours a day. So um, just know that you're, you might have to do that sometimes. Um, that is so true. You miss a lot of holidays and you have a lot of different families. Um, I have a question from the audience, um, uh, and this would be for each of you. What is one thing that you learned from being an athlete that you continue to use in your job or as a professional athlete? Um, Ashley? That's a great question. Man, I feel like I owe so much of my life to being an athlete and so much of my, uh, I guess, confidence as a woman in leadership to my time uh, on the court um, and the friendships that I made. And so I guess I would say um, two things. One, resilience, because you know, you go through injury, you go through, like life is just not fair. You, you, you're on the court and you, the ref makes a bad call. You don't like the coach, you're hurt, whatever it is, like uh, many things that will happen. Uh, and you must rise above that. You must rise above the circumstance. You must, you fall, you get knocked down eight times, you stand up on the ninth. So I think resilience is a big part of it. And I also think that um, I love basketball because it is five unique individuals that come together for the greater good, that you don't have five point guards, you don't have five centers, you need five people who can play together. And I think that's the importance of diversity um, and that's what I see making a beautiful team is that all of these unique voices, which is why we need women in leadership, so that there are more unique voices at the table so that there's a diverse team and a diverse representation to win. And so I think those are probably the two biggest things I've learned from sport. Uh, great. Lenora. I would say leadership as well, because I used to be a really shy person and uh, I didn't talk much, but then we've tracked you have to have a voice. And whenever I hit the track, you could see me. And then that's where I start to, to be. And I start to, to take place wherever I was going. So yes, sport teach me how to have my voice, to be there, to be present and to be a leader. Because even though my sport is individual, we still train as a team. And you have to, to find that person that will lead the team. and. I, I take that spot whenever I can because I like to put everybody together and be there and deliver. So yeah, I would say leadership. Okay, oh, that's great. Um, Ingrid. One so thing I, would say, I would say my the appreciation of difference differences in terms of when you're on a team, right, from little league club on up to college, you're meeting people from all walks of life. And that gives you, and I always talk about empathy skills. 
And so that helps develop your empathy skills because if you've learned how to deal with, you know, in volleyball, 15 or 14 other teammates, women for, you know, eight to 10 months out the year, that is building your empathy skills. That's building your, how do you understand people? And in this role, you have to be able to understand where people are coming from. Um, so I would say definitely my appreciation of people and the differences people and what they bring to the table and also to um, strategy, right? When you're playing sports, you're, you're thinking about, okay, if I'm the setter, where is it? Where's the blocker? You know, where's the, their strongest hitter that right now? So you learn how to be strategic. And so, and what we do as leaders and especially as athletic directors, we have to always be thinking about our strategy, our strategic plans. So I would say both of those things, the empathy skills that it helped build and then the strategy skills. Those are both very important. Um, Jennifer, what one thing? Yeah, those are very great answers. Um, you know, for me, I think the, the sayings that make you great um, as athletes make you great in the real world as well. So just the discipline that it takes to be good at whatever sport that you want to be, uh, to be good in the classroom, those things carry over. And um, that's been huge for me. It's just having that discipline, um, that structure that I've essentially had my entire life as an athlete to carry that over you know, into my professional life as well of having structure and having discipline to get the things done. Okay. And uh, Debbie, what's one well, thing you continue to use? You know, I agree with everything that was said. I was just thinking about Fortune 500 companies, Kim, and uh, the senior leadership who are female uh, in those companies almost always were athletes. Think about that. There's a reason that is that way. So I agree with everything that's been said. Okay, those are great answers and great qualities. And I think that our current, the current student athletes, uh, our young women on the call can certainly learn from that. Um, we do have men on the call and men, men and allies and mentors. Um, this question is what can men do to be better allies for women? Ingrid, I want to take that one before it's over. For you, after Ingrid, because I, I want to got a very strong opinion on this. I'm going to yield my time. <laughs> hey, Debbie, what can men do? Do not cut us any slack. We didn't ask for it. We don't want it. Treat us like anybody else. Okay. That's a strong That's opinion. It. That's it. I mean, I'm just saying. You know, this is the kiss of death, Kim. If they start giving you slack, they don't, wouldn't give a guy. It's it's over, right? It's it's already over. You don't even know it's over. So make it clear. This is not part of the deal, not part of the expectation. I'm up for it. I can do this. In fact, I might be able to do it better than you. So I don't need your help. Not in that way. Cut no slack. Yeah. Good. Jennifer, what can men do? I have to follow that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, you know, really, you know, use their their platform and their influence to reach back and help help everybody. And that's something that I touched on with Coach Rivera earlier. You know, he didn't have to open up his entire pool to everyone, um, but he did that for females. And um, obviously his wife's a coach, his daughter, you know, plays sports as well. So he's a little different. He's a girl dad, but to have that, that mindset to reach back and help people that may not look like you or be like you, um, been huge for me. Okay, uh, we have a question uh, for the women of color on the panel. Um, how do you think the intersections between race and gender have impacted your life or career? And how can we be better allies to women of color in sport? Ingrid, you want to start off with that one? Um, I, I was just so fortunate, just like um, my my other colleagues here, women of color. Um, I know to have a, a, my mom or a grandmother, someone, another black woman who emphasized from day one that I can understand what they what she was saying that I am you're black and you're a woman, so you're going to have to work harder than your peers. So that that has stuck with me, and that and so that's who I am. But it's also too when you know that it's like when you know what you're dealing with or you're going to get what you're getting into you know you know how to deal 
And so knowing that I, I am a black woman, I have been a black woman all my life, um, I've, I've been able to thrive because of that, because of being prepared and understanding this situation, they may perceive you, they may think of you, it's gonna be more challenging to get your foot in the door. So it has just prepared me to be more resourceful um, so that I can make sure that, that that opportunity is there for me and so that I can thrive. And so definitely it, it, it has been a barrier. My dissertation was on, I interviewed 10 African or black women administrators and we talked about their challenges, the barriers, um, but I'm so very, I'm excited because that, that, that those numbers are increasing um, slowly and there's programs and there's, there's people, there's allies in terms of the men that's on the call. Um, so it is promising, we have a long way to go, but I think because I've been taught that way, I've been raised that way to understand who I am, not as a barrier, but um, to be prepared for that. Okay, that's great feedback. Lenora? I actually learned that I was a black woman when I, when I moved to the US because on my island, I didn't realize that I was different. So whenever I moved to the US, then I realized, oh yeah, you're black, you're different. We're gonna have to work twice. Um, and I learned, and I'm glad I did, because whenever I went to France, then it started to show and um, people didn't see my value. They just saw me as a black person. And so they didn't know how to end on me. And whenever they knew that I was, I went to Olympics, then they knew that I'm some, I'm a hardworking person and that's where I have to take my place. But yeah, it was challenging. I have to work twice because people don't believe in us at first. But yeah, I had to learn, I, learned, I had to learn quick and that's why I'm still working right now, but it was challenging, but yeah. And you are in Martinique where it's very warm tonight or today, correct? Yes. That's awesome. Jennifer. Yeah, I totally agree with what they said as far as being brought up and, and raised on having to do things twice as well. And, and that's always been my mentality. And, um, you know, one important thing I think for, for the younger generation of people coming up is to support each other. Um, I think it's so important to support uh, women and, and women of color are the same, even if you're on the same journey, be there to support each other and help each other out along the way. Um, Cause that's one of been, my biggest thing is just supporting the, the other women that on the same journey that I am, it's been, been a really beautiful thing. Yeah, and Kim, can I add something? Um, you know, I think it's important to be an ally in this space, whether it's a male ally for females or whether it's a, you know, white woman advocating for people of color. I think it's important that we have allies and that we don't just wait for this to come from the top down, that we create the culture from within. It's not a position or a title. That's not what leadership is. It's about how do I use my sphere of influence? So don't laugh at that joke if it's not appropriate. Don't um, make sure you say, Jennifer, good idea. That was your idea. That was a great one. You know, so I think it's, I think it's an act of listening and an empathy and a promotion of the people from within our peer to peer, not just waiting for it to come from the top down. Thank you, Ashley. That's uh, that is so true. Um, we have a question: um, How can we best support trans and non-binary athletes in a system that adheres so strongly to a gender binary that restricts differences? There are lots of issues for all of us uh, right now. Um, uh, who would like to take that question, Ingrid? So uh, I think. With all of this, you know, with with this question, with the men, how they can be allies, I think you have to be present, right? You have to be in the space to learn and to understand um, their perspective and, and their challenges. So you can't help anyone if you don't understand. And so the first thing to me is to be present, be resourceful, so that you're educating yourself, so that you can best understand how to support and advocate. Um, I, I think. The more when I'm, I'm 
up against something that I don't really know a lot about. My, my team knows I'm going to ask a million questions and they also know I'm going to do my research as well. And so we have to understand from that perspective what it is that understanding what, what is the situation, how we can help, what do, we, what do they need um, and how to best support and advocate. Um, so I would say first being present and being in a space where that group is uh, to understand them better. Okay, great answer, great answer. We have about uh, five minutes left and um, I don't know if any of you follow Brene Brown um, or her podcast. Uh, they uh, end with rapid fire questions and I really like that. Um, so I thought we'd try out a few on you. So uh, start with um, Ashley. What is your favorite board game? Oh, charades, hands down, gestures, anything where you act. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, I'm gonna go with classic, you know. All right, uh, Lenora. Monopoly. What's that one? Is it Monopoly? I don't know if oh, you heard this. Monopoly. Yeah. Monopoly? That's good. Uh, Debbie. I, I could make something up. I'm not going to, Kim. I, I don't play board games. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Uh, mine is Taboo. Taboo. You can tell a little bit of the different sort of generations there in terms of the games. Um, all right, Debbie, what is your favorite type of cake? Chocolate. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, red velvet. Ashley. Chocolate whipped peanut butter icing. Lenora. Chocolate over chocolate over chocolate. <laughs> and Ingrid. Banana pudding cake. If you never mm. had it, mm, banana pudding cake. So banana good. pudding cake. Okay. Um, Lenora, what makes you laugh no matter what? Everything with a dog in it. Any video of a dog, I'll laugh. Okay, Ashley. I have a great friend, Tanya Pruitt, who I think is on the call. She makes me laugh hands down every time. Also, dad jokes, those are great. I mean, they're so corny, I laugh, so. Ingrid. I would have to say my mother-in-law, but also lately, because I've lost so much sleep, is TikTok. <laughs> Goodness. Don't be binging on that TikTok. I go down the rabbit hole every night. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, watching old episodes of Martin. Of Martin? Yes. Okay. I can say, Debbie, what makes you laugh no matter what? And do you know what TikTok is? Of course I know what TikTok is. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't make me laugh. My cat makes me laugh. Your cat makes you laugh. Rescue okay. cat. Oh. Uh, just, just a superb rescue cat that I can't believe we took for two weeks and now we, while they were looking for a forever home, Kim, and now we're the forever home. You're the, what's, your, what's your cat's name? Twilight, they had already named her because he used to come to the apartment complex at night at around Twilight looking for food. So they named her Twilight when they gave her to us. That's what they said her name was. So that's what we wow. call her. Yep, she's a good, she's a good kitty. All right, uh, Debbie, what did you want to be when you were 12? A uh, teacher and a coach. Jennifer. Uh, police officer. Ashley. Art teacher, basketball coach. Lenora. Terminary. Ingrid. A doctor. A doctor. Okay, last uh, rapid fire question. Um, Ingrid, how do you start your day? Uh, first, thanking God that I'm, I'm waking up. Um, a glass of water, two boiled eggs, and reading emails. <laughs> Ashley. No eggs, <laughs> but thank you, God. Christine Kane devotional at the moment and, uh, and a workout. Okay, Debbie. Prayer while still in bed before my feet hit the ground because once that happens, it might not happen at all. Uh, and then coffee, please. Please, coffee. Lenora. I'm stretching, I burn some incense, and then I'm doing some waffle. How about you, Jennifer? Uh, I usually take about five minutes just to kind of uh, think about the day and then uh, get some breakfast. 
Okay, that, that's great. Um, I hate that we have to wrap this up, um, but our time together is coming to an end. I could listen to you all for, for hours. Um, uh, Lenora, Ingrid, Ashley, Jennifer, and Debbie, thank you for sharing tonight and paying it forward. Um, your passion, your grit and determination have allowed women to move the needle and as some would say, kick glass. Um, thanks to all of our participants. We had uh, right at 214 people. Um, so let's all pay it forward and share. And um, thank you all so much and uh, good luck uh, with whatever you choose to do in the future. And thanks, Kim. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Girls, 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 girls,